Good morning. So glad you're here with us today to worship at Benton's Crossroads. Now, Benton's Crossroads, I can't believe I said that. Oh. Oh, my goodness. Our stones are going to be cast. You know, after almost 14 years of saying that every day, it's hard, or every Sunday. Welcome to Mountain Springs Baptist Church. Wow. We're glad you're here at Mountain Springs Baptist Church <laughs> to worship with us. Um, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, that we can laugh together, we can cry together, Lord, we can exercise forgiveness, Father. We just pray that uh, today, Lord, that you would show up here in a mighty way. Father, thank you for every song that's going to be sung today, Lord, the, the preaching of your word, Lord. Um, we give you praise for it all. I thank you for yesterday, for all those that, that came out and did so much work around the church. We look forward to Vacation Bible School next week, Father, and pray that uh, lives will be changed through, Lord, not us, but you speaking to your people, Lord. So we just look for salvations to take place, Lord. Be with us this morning, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. This time we're going to uh, hear from our Vacation Bible School. Good morning, everyone. We're out here at Mountain Springs Baptist Church getting ready for Vacation Bible School. The theme this year is the Great Jungle Journey, and we are very excited for everyone to come out here and join us for this year's, uh, is this where I sign up for the cruise? Um, excuse me? The cruise. I saw a flyer for the Great Jungle Cruise, and I'm ready to go. I think you might be a little bit confused. I think you mean cruise, not confuse. Where do I sign up? Uh, well, the, the Great Jungle Cruise is not, it's not a boat cruise. It's a cruise through the Bible. A cruise through the Bible? Yep. The flyer said epic cruise. Yep, it is an epic cruise from Genesis to Revelation. So, I don't need my suitcase? No, <laughs> no suitcase needed. You'll come to church here uh, every night, and we're going to be... Learn, we're going to be cruising through time, learning the seven seas of history in a jungle-themed adventure. Okay, so the Great Jungle Cruise is a Bible school thing. We'll be cruising through history, discovering more about our Creator and how much He loved us. Well, I guess I should have read the details, but I just saw Epic Cruise and I just rushed right over. Well, you can still sign up, even if it's not the type of cruise that you expected. We'll be here every evening, June 9 to 14, 6 to 8.30 p.m. Definitely. I'll be there. Oh, good. We'll be glad to see you. Uh, Vacation Bible School will be here at Mountain Springs Baptist Church, June 9 through 14, 6 to 8.30 p.m. It will be, the, the theme is the Great Jungle Journey, and we will have activities for everyone birth through adult. The link to sign up is posted on our Facebook page and in the link in our bio on Instagram. Hope to see you there. Please stand as we uh, open up and sing hymn number 461, I Love to Tell the Story. Oh 
you to re- share the scriptures, number 6, verse 22 to 27. Okay. That's what y'all are singing about. Somebody's got to pray over the offering. Yes, I got kind of carried away and all, so anyway. All right. <clears throat> okay, as we uh, bring it time now for our uh, worship through a giving and, uh, you know, of the offering this morning, I'd like to ask you to please... Uh, Brother Bobby, would you mind opening us up in prayer, please? 
spake to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. The Lord bless you. shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you and around you and behind you and with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your 
you're coming and you're going in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. 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 child that would go to children's church if you'll follow my wife anyone all right you can come sit back down there <laughs> if you have your bibles one i want to invite you to turn with me to matthew chapter five we're going to be looking at verses 27 through 32 last week i I jumped ahead of this scripture to cover um, what I felt like would work well with last Sunday. and uh, But today I want to go back and capture these verses. Today we're talking about adultery and divorce. Today's message is for those who are going to be married in the future, for those who are already married, and those who may be divorced. I imagine everyone in this room in some way, shape, or form has been touched by divorce in some way. Um, I have been in my family. And it's probably one of the hardest things that I've ever had to navigate through in my life. Um, just to, to have someone you dearly love be hurt so much. And so... Um, I pray that you will really pay attention to, that, to this today. No couple starts out thinking they're going to get divorced. It's not even in their mind. Marriage is a oneness. You own each other's stuff. Prenups. If you hear the word prenup, you need to run. That just starts out, out with the idea that we're going to get divorced someday. Statistics in America. One divorce happens every 36 seconds in America. If you have people that have multiple marriages, the divorce rate goes like this. First marriage, 42% of all first marriages end in divorce. Second marriages, it goes up to 60%. Third marriage is 73%. And just imagine, fourth, fifth, I, I, I know someone that's been married at least seven times. And it um, blows my mind. Focus on the family did research on couples that go to church. A Dr. Wilcox is the one who headed up that research. And he did the studies, and he said that there's a 35% less likely chance of divorce if that couple goes to church, prays together, fellowships together with other believers, and they get involved. So if you're in church and you're doing all those things, you're involved. You're not just coming on Sunday 
and occupying a pew together and then you leave. I'm talking about couples that come to church, they worship together. Throughout the week, they're praying together. They're spending quality time together. And at church, they get involved in that small group Sunday school class. Or maybe they have a small group outside of the church they get together with. Christian believers where you spend time with one another, loving on each other and supporting one another, helping each other through the difficult times. If you have that in your life, the chance of a divorce is only 7%. That's a drastic change, isn't it? It does show that being in God's house, worshiping the Lord, and spending time with brothers and sisters in Christ has great value when it comes to your marriage. Those who are members but don't really go to church, the rate goes up by 20%. So that means 55% more likely chance of getting divorced. You go to church, but the other things are not there. You're not involved in that small group. You're not praying with your spouse. You're not worshiping truly together. You might occupy a pew together, but there's not that, that intimacy with each other, even from the pew. When I'm, it's, We don't get to sit together in church most of the time because I'm up here and she's down there. But when we are, we're normally holding hands or something like that. So, there's great value in that. There's schools of thought on divorce. I'm going to get to the scripture here in just a minute. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, it talks about the schools of thoughts there on divorce. It says, furthermore, it's been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. I'll go back and get chapter 27 in just a minute. So the schools of divorce, they're, they're referred to in Matthew 5, 31 and 32 from the Sermon on the Mount, but also in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, where it says, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it, it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. Now the debate in Jesus' day was two schools of thought. There was the school of Hillel. His name's H-I-L-L-E-L. That's how you pronounce him. And he said you can divorce for these reasons. First of all, she did not find grace in his sight. Secondly, she goes out on the street with her hair loose. So that means, ladies, you have to keep your hair tied up all the time if you were in this school of thought. Third, if she spins around in public, he can give her a divorce for that. <laughs> Number four is the best one of all. She burns his dinner. Or maybe number five is the best. She is a noisy woman, meaning her voice could be heard by the neighbor. And that's just the short list that this gentleman in the school of Hillel came up with. But then there was another school called the school of Shania, and it had just two things. You could divorce if there was marital unfaithfulness, or sexual sin in the marriage, but it didn't have to mandate divorce. It's only a reason you could. Repentance and forgiveness can happen. Let's look at verse 27. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. 
for it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Again, verse 31. Furthermore, it's been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. There's so much that we need to realize in this, in, in these two schools of thought and, and this whole thing with divorce. It, first of all, when divorce happens, it doesn't just affect that man and his wife. If there are children involved, it affects those children. Those children end up being sent back and forth from one home to the other. Children grow up having a mom and a dad that possibly don't get, a, get along well. They've divorced, and so there's anger at each other. And so once in a while, they're throwing stones at each other, and their children are hearing that. Mom's talking down dad, dad's talking down mom, and the kids are stuck in the middle because the children love both mom and dad. Parents are affected by that. We were greatly affected when it hit our family. Just a hurt. I looked at my daughter-in-law as one of my own children. Loved her. And for so long... I was that guy holding the stone when that woman was brought before Jesus that was caught in the very act of adultery. You remember that man holding the stone with other men there and they, they looked at Jesus and they said, here's what the law said, what do you say? And Jesus said, you who are without sin cast the first stone. I was that guy holding the stone. And every time I would start to drop it, she would do something that would cause anger to come back up in me and I'd pick that stone back up. I carried that with me for, for a long time, folks. Just hurt. Seeing my grandchildren hurt, seeing my son hurt, and just going through that pain and the anger. Because I thought, I'm a pastor. Surely this is not going to hit my family. But it did. And as a result of that, God used that time in my life to grow me even more. Where Satan was trying to use it to cause me to not be effective as a witness calls me to want to be a person that's not pleasing to the Lord. God used it as an opportunity to grow me in my walk, to teach me some things about forgiveness. Then the Bible say, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. That's what he told that man that day. And what happened? Those men, one by one, they started dropping the stones, dropping their heads, walking away. Because they were all guilty of sin. And all of us in this room, we have sin in our lives. You will battle that till the day you die. And so, it's, it's a thing that we all struggle with. And the Scripture gives us, first of all, the only reason we think for divorce is that thing of adultery taking place. But actually, Scripture gives us one other reason. If you were to read verse, verses 31 and 32, you'd find that term for adultery. But then if you were to read Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, let's look at it. Matthew 19, verses 1 through 10. 
It says, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee, and he came to a region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and a great multitude followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? He answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? He made them male and female. And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Then they said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Because Moses, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, If such is the case of a man with his wife, is it not better to marry? So they were questioning the Lord about this whole thing of adultery. And, and he's saying, that's one reason. But there is another reason. If you were to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 16, here's the other reason for divorce. It says this, Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be rec reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, say, If any brother has a wife who does not believe, meaning she's not a Christian, she's not a Christ follower, but to the rest I, not the Lord, say, If any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. So those, that's two people that's unequally yoked. One saved and one is not saved. Verse 13, And a woman who has, who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. You see, he keeps saying, don't divorce. With everything in you, if, even if they've had adultery, the Bible says you can divorce, but with them, even in that, do so. And here in this situation, it's saying if you're an unequally yoked, one saved, one's not saved, and you've got this battle going on in the family all the time between the two worlds you live in, it's saying stay together. Why? Verse 14, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the believing wife, unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. Meaning, if there's a mom or a dad in the home that's a Christian and they're sharing with those children, they're living before their children a godly life, the children can be sanctified. The children can come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. But if that's not the case, if, if your children see dad staying with mom who's not saved or vice versa, and they see the love that they demonstrate even though they're not equally yoked, that does something in the children's lives to bring them to Jesus. Verse 15, here's the other reason that divorce is okay. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. So if you're in a relationship where you're unequally yoked and that wife who's lost she leaves, or that husband who's lost leaves. Scripture there says, it's okay. Let them go. You're not under bondage in these cases. He says, but God has called us to peace. 
For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? So again, he's saying, as much as possible within you, stay. Stay. Because you never know what God can do to bring about healing. Some folks say, well, what if I'm unsafe in my marriage? What if my husband beats me? What if my wife is constantly tearing me down and just calling me all kinds of names, slapping me, hitting me, and all? And folks, that happens. Trust me. It happens. I told you last week, I think, that I'm serving on the grand jury for Union County, and you wouldn't believe every time I have to report for jury duty the things I hear that go on in people's marriages. It's unreal. It's so sad. I leave there every time burdened because of what I'm hearing going on in homes. This past week when I was there, I heard of a situation where there was a man and wife and they were at, at odds with each other where the man decided he was going to kill his wife. He walked into the home with a gun in his hand. The parents were actually there, so they got involved too, and multiple murders took place because of it. In Union County. And it all was over a marital situation that had gone bad. It's sad. If you are in an unsafe situation in harm's way, as a process for reconciliation and healing, it's okay for, to, for you to step away from that. I'm not saying divorce. I'm saying it's okay for your life to be rescued, to step away from that relationship for a time of prayer, fasting, and counseling. Not dating. Did you hear me? Prayer, fasting, and counseling. If Deanna and I were in an argument with each other and, and she wanted to knock my head off, then it, it would be okay for me to step away for a little while so I'd be safe to pray and to fast, to seek the Lord's will in all of this thing, to seek some counseling possibly, but not to go out dating. That's the thing we have to understand is that there are times when people are unsafe. Does God expect you to stay in a loveless marriage? Maybe. Why is that? a loveless marriage he might be trying to teach you something you learn a lot when you're going through difficult things if life was always filled with roses and, and you got up every day and it was like oh in life good man I got plenty of money in the bank I've got everything I desire as far as material things go I, I, I'm just so happy all the time, except for one thing. My husband, my wife, they're a pain. They don't think the way I think. Have y'all noticed God puts people together that are different? I imagine if I were to go through this room and ask every married couple if y'all were just alike, I'd get a lot of no's. Deanna and I are very different. She is a take charge person. She will speak her mind. Am I not right? Darlin's her best friend. <laughs> she will speak her mind. She will tell you what she thinks. She loves her family to a passion. She looks at her children, and even though they're adults now, she still thinks of them as little kids at times, and she'll 
she'll want to give them advice when they're not asking for it. Am I right, kids? Yeah. But she loves you. And she loves me. I have no doubt about that. She loves me. This past week, it was a funny thing. She asked me one morning, she said, Honey, what do you think my nickname is for you? And she was expecting me to say, Darling or Baby or Honey or something like that. And I said, My nickname for you is Will You. And she said, What? I said, You're all the time saying, Will you do this? Will you do that? Will you do that? Or whatever. And so we had a good laugh over that. I never thought she'd post it out on social media, but she did. And got a lot of laughs over it. I'm different from her. I am more of a sort of sit back and think things through before acting. And just to process stuff. Sometimes I drag my feet on some things. and See, God's brought us together to, to bring her to a place of pushing me when I need a little push. And I've been brought into her life to say, hey, wait, let's think about this for a minute. Y'all have the same problem, don't you? <laughs> oh, my goodness. A lot of us are in that type of situation. We're, well, all of you, you're married to somebody that's not completely just like you. If we were just alike, wouldn't that be boring? <laughs> That's true. So God did not put us in a relationship with somebody that's just like us. The Lord says that He can bring us happiness. But... The thing we need to understand about that is that when we ask that question, doesn't God want me to be happy? I know our Constitution says this. I wrote it down. We hold these truths, Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are to be created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, the Lord says He came to bring us joy and peace. And we get the word joy and happiness mixed up sometimes. Happy is that word, and this, this is in the Greek. It's that Greek word, mar, markarios. And it means supremely blessed, fortunate, well off. But the Lord said He's brought us, He wants us to bring us joy and peace. Now, joy is that Greek word kara, and it means cheerfulness, a calm delight, a gladness. Peace, I love the word peace. It's that word arene, and it means to be at one. So you can have rest, and you can have peace in your life. The Lord desires for us to have those things in our life. He wants us to be a, a people that are happy, yes, but not the happy that we think of. A happy that is just all the time laughing, excited. That's momentary, right? We have momentary times of just happiness. You get up and everything's going good, or maybe you're excited because you're getting ready to go on vacation, or whatever it is. You have that momentary happiness. But joy and peace, those are things that you can have all the time. You see the difference? Joy and peace is something I can have even when it's raining outside. To have that calmness in myself. That peace of knowing that I'm in God's hands. And He said He'd never leave me nor forsake me. He said that He would guide my path. He said that He loved me. And so I can have that regardless of what else is going on, going on in my life. Marriage is a, a precious gift from God, and I'm thankful for it. I met Deanna, I think it was in 1989. 
Hurricane Hugo had just come through. And some folks at First Baptist Indian Trail set she and I up to go out after church one night. I thought she was a lot younger. She is five years younger than me. But I remember we got married. She was just turned 19, I believe, and I was 24. She was at home living with mom and dad. I, I was on my own in an apartment. I had my first big boy job working for the toy company. And some folks at the church decided we would look good together, and so they set it up to where after church one night we would go to McDonald's as a group. And they arranged it for her to ride with me. I had a little Bronco 2 at that time, and she got in the car with me, and I thought, pretty girl. She was so nervous when we got to McDonald's, she wouldn't even order. Even though I, they arranged for us to sit across from each other at, at the thing. After it was all done, everybody decided that they were going to take off and make it to where she and I had to ride just the two of us back to the church. So I took her back to the church, and we're sitting in the parking lot there at First Baptist Indian Trail. And we began to talk. And we talked, and we talked, and we talked. God was in that car with us. We didn't realize how long we'd talked. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. And I said, oh my goodness, your parents are going to kill me. She got in her car because we'd left it at the church, and I followed her home. I went home that night. I decided not to go to my apartment, which was in Charlotte, but I went to my parents who lived in Indian Trail. I walked in, and I said, uh, Mom, my mother woke up, and she said, Who's that? <laughs> I said, Mom, it's just me. Is everything okay? Yeah, I just met my wife. All right, we'll talk about it in the morning. <laughs> found out later Deanna went home and her mother was still up waiting on her to get home and she said what are you coming in so late for I just met my husband that was in October I proposed in December we got ferried, married the following June and six months after being married we were pregnant with our first a little boy named Chase Balkum. Has life always been easy? No. There's been fights like you wouldn't believe. But we still, down deep, know that we love each other. She's my bride. If you have gone through a divorce, I, I'm not condemning you for that. That's the past. Leave it there. But what I'm saying is the future can be different. Healing can take place in your life. If you're in a relationship right now and you're struggling, I can't tell you anything better to do than just to fast, to pray, to seek God's will. what he wants for your life he wants you to be obedient to him would you pray with me father I ask you to speak to the hearts of each and everybody here this morning Lord that if there's folks here today going through something difficult in their life If they're in a marriage, Father, that they're struggling, I pray, Father, that today you would give them peace. Lord, you ordained marriage. In your creation week, you looked at Adam and you said that that was the only thing that wasn't good about all that you'd created. You saw that he was alone, and you said, that's not good. And so you gave him Eve. 
And Father, I'm thankful, Lord, that you've given me a bride. I'm thankful for the blessing of marriage, for children, and now grandchildren. What a joy it has been in my life. I'm thankful for the difficult days because it's made us stronger as a couple. But Lord, I realize that there may be some folks here today that they're in a relationship that is not like mine. A relationship where there's hardship, where there's anger. Maybe they're unequally yoked. One's saved and one's not. Father, I just pray that for those people in this room right now that are going through that type of situation, that you would speak into their lives, Lord, to show yourself in such a mighty way to let them know what your will would be for them because you love them. And for those that have suffered divorce in this room, Lord, bring healing to their lives. Lead them, guide them, direct them, because the future is still out there waiting. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today they'll realize that by accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we, as the church, are the bride of Christ. And Father, what a great day that's going to be when you call us home. Where the bride of Christ, the church, is united together with our groom our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you. So for that one here today that's lost, I pray that they'll surrender their life today to Jesus. I pray for those that just need to come and say thank you, Lord, for the marriage you've given me, that they'll come. For those that may have struggles, Lord, I pray they'll come. And just seek your face, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just stand with me. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I invite you to come. And let me pray the sinner's prayer with you. And help you make the greatest decision you've ever made in your life. Let's sing together, Brother Tony. Hymn number 349. Caitlin, you come up here with me.
Did I say your name right? I thought she was already a member of the church, but she's not. So she's come down this morning saying she wants to be a member of Mountain Springs, not Benton's Crossroads. Mountain Springs Baptist <laughs> Church. Have you been baptized? Okay, praise the Lord. So she's coming on her statement of faith here is, uh, to be a member of this church. You can come stand with her. This is a, uh, a Barbie and Ken, just not blonde hair. <laughs> Don't y'all agree? <laughs> Our emotion the second we receive her as a member of this church. All right. All in favor, say praise the Lord. Praise That's the Lord. right. That's great. Well, we're still going to give you that hand of invitation or that, um, what do you call it, hand of fellowship. <laughs> yeah. So you walk your wife to the back, and I'll join you there in a minute. Um, so tonight we'll have Bible study. We're going to continue through Revelation. And... Um, so come out and be a part of that this evening. I want to thank all of those who came out yesterday and did the work around the church. It was amazing, uh, everything that got done, and uh, appreciate so much the breakfast and the lunch. It was, you know, it was, it was just an awesome day. So thank you, ladies and men that participated yesterday. That was incredible. Uh, don't forget, Vacation Bible School starts when? Next Sunday. That's right. So we're going to have a big week. Not this week, but the following week. But next Sunday is when it all starts. So uh, come be a part of that. There, there's something for every age. Uh, our uh, and some other men are going to be leading a Bible study for the adults every night. So I'm, come be a part of that. If you have children and you haven't registered them yet, go online and do that. If you don't know how to do that, see Miss Connie. And she'll help you with that. Uh, we'll get your children registered for Vacation Bible School. The only reason we need that is so, first of all, we want to know how much food to make and uh, as far as rooms and having space for everybody. Uh, it's going to be amazing, though. I, I tell you, the decorations around the church are incredible. Uh, so a lot of hard works went into making this happen. Now we're just looking for the harvest, Right. For Jesus to speak truth into some children's lives and maybe some adults' lives and see salvation take place. So come be a part of Vacation Bible School, okay? Let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you, Lord. You are precious in our sight. Thank you for the gift of marriage, Father. But also, Lord, realize that there are folks that are going through difficult things in their marriage, Father. And you can bring healing there, Lord. You are the creator, so there's nothing that's beyond your capabilities. So, Father, we just search and seek your will to be done. Lord, help us to stay in the center of it. And, Lord, that you would be pleased with us, that we can do our very best, Father, realizing that sometimes the person we're with, we can't change them, Lord. Only you can do that. But help us to do our part, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.